So now we're going to move on with the benefit of a great panel to think about uh, what this means for resilience. And uh, we've heard generally this morning in the first panel around resilience and the, the breadth of threats, but we're now going to concentrate on climate change, the climate change agenda, and uh, what we can uh, do about it. Um, we have, I hope, four panelists. I've met three of them, but I'm hoping the fourth has uh, uh, appeared um, uh, outside of my field of vision. Um, they are uh, Siausi Sovaleni, who's the Deputy Prime Minister of Tonga, and who I'd like to invite to uh, come up to the panel. Uh, for him and for the other panelists, you've got a brief bio in your pack, so I'm not going to take up time when you could be listening to them talking by uh, assuming that you can't read. Uh, we have Joe Tyndall, who's the uh, climate change ambassador for the government of New Zealand and whose uh, role the minister praised. I'd like just to say that um, one of the interesting things about going to the conferences, like the Paris conference, is how different countries uh, perform and the fact that a relatively small country in uh, not the central place uh, uh, near Paris can punch above its weight, which I really think is what uh, New Zealand did, uh, along with some others in actually creating the momentum for that agreement. And then we have uh, Peter Woolcott, who's the High Commissioner uh, from uh, Australia, a uh, country which has um, uh, had some interesting perspectives on climate change. Uh, and um, uh, who we really look forward to hearing from. And then um, Anna Lehman, who uh, has various hats that she wears, but one of them is as a Vice President for Policy uh, for the Carbon Markets uh, Investors Association. So we'll maybe hear a bit about, about markets. Um, we know what the Paris Agreement is. We've heard a very eloquent uh, exposition from the minister about the challenge now of turning that into execution. What we'd like to do is hear from the panelists about uh, what executing the uh, outcome of Paris is going to mean for uh, resilience in the energy system in their particular context and more generally. So I'd like to invite CLC uh, to the podium or to sit and pre present whichever you prefer. Thank you. Malo um, that's the same as Giara in my uh, Tongan language. Unfortunately, I just lost that <laughs> part of my speech. <laughs> Bear of technologies. I mean, Tong Tonga is a very small country. So I mean, uh, uh, and, and now in terms of uh, emissions, we're very, very small, tiny in contributions. But we're one of the most, say, vulnerable countries in the Pacific. Uh, in the last three years in the Pacific, we have had five category five cyclones. 2014, it was tropical cyclone uh, Ian, that was in Tonga. 14, that was in Vanuatu, cyclone Pam. And this year, it was cyclone Winston. In Tonga alone, in our current cyclone season, the last four months, we have had visit, visit from four tropical cyclones, four in one cyclone season. So we have had our shares of extreme weather and, and other associates like El Nino and so forth. And let me still try and look for this. One of, one of the, the key, I guess, instrument in the COP21 was the INTC. Most of you are familiar with it. One of the, the our, our efforts now is actually changing or trying to actually get from an INTC to an NTC. And one of those key measures is actually increasing the share of renewable energy to about 50%. And this is very important for Donga 
not not just because renewable energy is you know is the buzz thing these days, but it's also it make economic sense. Uh, the fact is that the electricity sector is about takes about 30 percent of our of our fuel. By reducing that, you can do the numbers. It makes sense in terms of uh, balance of payment and so forth. It's also very important, in fact, because I mean it strengthened our energy security. We are less prone for you know the, the fluctuation in in, in uh, fuel price and, and related uh, physical risks. But more importantly, it actually makes the energy sector more resilient, and thus Tonga more resilient. Um, Tonga uh, consider climate change as one of our key priorities. We are, what we're trying to do right now is integrating it into our national development framework. Similarly, building resilience, especially to reduce the impacts of climate change, we are actually doing similar kind of efforts. And a testimony to this is that 30% of our development assistance is on resilient related activities, 30%. So that's 30% that we could have used for education, we could have used for health, but because Tonga consider climate change and building our resilience that important, 30% of that assistance goes into that particular efforts. There are certain things that we have experienced that I guess it's worthwhile discussing. One of them is having better coordination between, uh, amongst development partners. We, we are very appreciative of the fact that there's a lot of partners out there who are trying to help, but I think more can be done about coordinating them. We have Australia that actually have a, a readiness facility. We've got ComSec. We've got the GCF readiness uh, facility. There's a number of them out there. But we have a feeling that some of them are focusing more on the quick wins, you know, getting things done, putting some tick beside the boxes. But I believe it, it's like winning the battle. What we should be preparing ourselves is more for the thrown out battle that we have with climate change. And that means having a little bit more investment into building uh, a capacity on the ground and in these countries. I believe that this is the, the, the means to actually make these uh, countries more resilient. Uh, let me wade into this definition of resilience that we've been discussing this morning. I like to relate it to rugby. Once upon a time, I used to play rugby, so <laughs> I can actually understand a little bit about it. Uh, in rugby, when you're about to actually play another team, you need to actually learn more about the opposition. In this case, you need to learn more about climate change. You need to prepare, you need to do some weightlifting, do some runs to actually prepare yourself. You also need to actually get appropriate skills. So when you're actually playing against the other team, you know when to actually take a sidestep so that the other guy can miss you. You also need to actually take the hit. So when you get hit, you know, it's not that bad. But if you're down, you need to be able to get up and continue playing. I believe that's the simplest way you can explain it to a Pacific Islander in relation to actually using rugby uh, as a mean to actually explain what resilience is all about. Getting hit, being able to actually get up and play the game. One of the other uh, challenges that we face is resource tenure. I mean, in the Pacific, we have a whole lot of low-lying islands, and most of them are suffering from inundations and, and similar kind of uh, events. But you know, trying and moving there somewhere else, it, it's proving to be difficult. We have very different land tenure system in most of the Pacific Island countries. So that, that's becoming one of the hardest things to do. Uh, one, one example is that in Tonga, we have this group of islands. Their capital is in the red zone. You know, when we do the, the, the mapping and so forth, that particular capital is in the red zone. But we cannot move it. Basically, because there is a whole lot of investment in infrastructure. There is no land available. We don't have that much land. So that, that's always going to be a problem. And, and this is pretty much due to the sea level rising and, and associated uh, events. Uh, I guess the other reality is actually prioritizing priorities. All of us have priorities. But we need to actually reprioritize it. What they normally refer to as distilling climate change priorities. It's actually taking the wish list 
to the help to this. Because I mean, most of us, actually a whole lot of long list of, of priorities that we actually get GCF or CHEF to actually look at. But I think in reality, we need to actually relook at it, uh, reprioritize and see what actually can have the best impact for you. I think apart from talking about the financing, which I'm, I'm sure that we will cover later on, those are some of the, the initial thoughts about climate change in the Pacific. Thank you. Thank you very much. So your capital and Wellington uh, both have quite a lot in common here. Um, but uh, could we now ask Jo to say a few words from uh, her perspective, please? And again, you can sit there or come to the podium. Ashwa. Thanks very much, Joan, and uh, it's uh, great to be here uh, for this uh, summit today. Uh, in thinking about the, the topic, it was really hard to work out where to focus things. Um, having been steeped in climate change things for the last almost six years, uh, I could probably rabbit on for many hours, um, but I won't. Uh, just wanted to focus on a, a couple of things. Following the incredibly historic um, moment we had when the Paris Agreement and associated decisions were gaveled through um, uh, by Minister Laurent Fabius uh, on the 12th of December last year. Great part of history to, uh, uh, to participate in. And I think um, for many countries in the Asia-Pacific region, energy is a key challenge in tackling climate change. Now, as you've just heard from the distinguished um, minister, um, the driver for tackling energy issues is not necessarily climate change at all. In fact, quite often isn't. Um, and I think around the region there are slight variations. So cost to the economy, where across the Pacific, I think it averages out at about 10% um, of, uh, I'm not sure if it's GDP or, or government budgets. But it is um, a significant uh, uh, cost. So that and, and energy security uh, are key drivers for moving to clean energy solutions. Um, in more heavily populated parts um, of Asia, uh, I think there is not only that driver, but more particularly uh, questions of air pollution and health uh, that are drivers for, for action being taken to shift to, to clean energy. So, uh, I think versions of that energy trilemma are very much alive and well. For those of us here, everybody knows New Zealand's perspective is a little bit different. Uh, for us, the primary challenge in climate change is dealing with biological emissions from food production. Methane, nitrous oxide accounting for about 50%, half of our greenhouse gas emissions. We know that in that case, the technology is not there currently for really significantly reducing those emissions, um, and there is no non-emitting alternative as there is um, in the case of energy. We also know that for New Zealand, we're in the happy position of um, already uh, um, uh, producing 80% of our electricity using renewable uh, resources. And there's a bit of a paradox here. We've got a target to move to 90%, um, and our last coal-fired uh, um, power generation is slated to, to close in, in a couple of years' time. But uh, in the face of static consumer demand, although there are a lot of clean energy projects consented, um, the demand hasn't been there to, to justify the new bills uh, just yet. But um, although uh, agricultural emissions are our number one problem, uh, Energy from industrial processing and from transport emissions uh, are two sectors creating significant challenges for New Zealand, um, with transport accounting for 20% of, of our emissions and really being, uh, if I can use the term driven by, um, a di dispersed population. We know, though, uh, that we, we would be a bit of a sitter for electric vehicles. Um, and so we've been certainly looking closely at market developments there, what's happening with the cost curve um, of EVs, uh, and uh, what other governments might be doing to encourage the, the, the move 
uh, towards electric vehicles and, and certainly hybrids. Hybrids, And I think Minister Bridges um, last night even was uh, uh, foreshadowing uh, some ac action there. Um, the pace, I think, certainly needs to step up to account for the pace of climate change. Again, um, uh, building on the comments uh, Minister Bennett um, was making this morning and, and the question from the floor about the uh, temperature rises or the, the huge temperature um, uh, above global average we've seen in the last three months. Um, for governments and business to take action, though, it needs to be in their interest to do so. Doing so out of a sense of moral obligation does not always work. In fact, it often doesn't. For those of you who haven't looked at it, I think it's well worth checking out a new climate economy report uh, published last year um, that targeted three areas, energy, land and cities, and came up with a suite of recommendations using existing technology that spoke to actions that would be in finance minister's interest to contemplate, um, and also, I think, in the interests of publicly listed companies. So overall, I would see there's an overarching message from um, a government perspective being to price it right. And pricing it right was a term um, Christine Lagarde um, of the IMF um, used uh, at a, a speech I heard her, her give at the IMF World Bank Spring Meetings in Washington DC last year. So pricing that right, some of it um, is the market. So there you've got cost curves coming down dramatically for solar, um, wind, uh, renewable sources of energy. Um, and it's still often competitive, even with the uh, um, historically low oil prices we've got at the moment. Um, talked about uh, electric vehicle technology and infrastructure moving and on the cusp of getting down on that cost curve. Energy efficiency, I think, is another example, and it's clearly in the interests um, of both business and consumers to uh, um, benefit from the cost savings that uh, derive from energy efficiency, but it often needs a bit of a regulatory nudge uh, to encourage it. I was at um, an INDC forum last October that looked at the cumulative impact of these um, contributions that had been tabled in the lead up to, uh, to Paris. Um, and uh, the calculation was that if everyone implemented um, all the things they said they would do in their INDCs, we would limit global temperature at, at its most optimistic to um, a, a rise of 2.7 degrees above pre-industrial levels. Um, not bad, better than business as usual scenarios of between four and five degree rise, um, but uh, still a long way short of where we need to be to stop dangerous uh, um, climate, uh, temperature rise. So there was a, uh, an IEA, um, International Energy Agency, presentation that looked at how we could deal with that wedge between the two degrees goal, um, let alone the 1.5, it didn't look at that, um, and the aggregate impact of INDCs. Interestingly, it said that on the basis of current technologies, nearly half, 49% of that wedge could be closed or dealt with through energy efficiency. A further 17% um, could be dealt with through uh, transition to renewable energy, um, and 10% through reform of fossil fuel subsidies. Um, so this was, you know, in the period to 2020 to try and, and close the, the wedge. So it's, it, it struck me as a virtuous circle there. Um, if you looked at those three things together, energy efficiency, renewable energy, reform of fossil fuel subsidies, that accounted for 77% um, of the, the total, that wedge. And because um, inefficient fossil fuel subsidies encourage wasteful consumption of fuel and tilt the playing field against investment of renewable energy, those three things are a very close and important uh, fit together. So one part of pricing it right is to phase out inefficient fossil fuel subsidies. And here I just want to mention New Zealand's a, a member of um, a small but perfectly formed group, the Friends of Fossil Fuel Subsidy Reform. Um, that is around building momentum to help uh, and support phase out of, of fossil fuel subsidies, especially while oil prices are low, when the political shocks of making those changes are much reduced. And there's a range of activities we're involved in 
peer reviews, a political communique, encouraging countries to include fossil fuel subsidy reform in their INDCs um, that uh, I could talk about uh, a little bit later. To us, it seems a complete logical absurdity to try to incentivise behaviour by, on the one hand, putting price on carbon, and on the other hand, subsidising fossil fuels to a global tune of 400 US billion dollars per annum, or thereabouts, that incidentally dwarfs the investment um, in renewable energy globally, and is four times that uh, the, the global goal we have of mobilising 100 billion per annum by 2020 in climate finance. So the second part of pricing it right is to put a price on carbon. Um, the minister talked about the New Zealand emissions trading scheme, <coughs> scheme and the review that's currently happening. And we are seeing the acceleration of pricing systems, especially in the Asia-Pacific area. I think Korea, China, Japan um, already acting, uh, and uh, there's planning or exploratory work in a range of other countries. Carbon markets are hugely important to help maximise ambition, and I think the last point I wanted to make was New Zealand was really pleased with the outcome uh, from the Paris Agreement that saw a substantive article, Article 6, dealing with carbon markets. Thank you. Uh, pleased and partly responsible for Article 6. Um, thank you, Joan. We're seeing a theme here about the um, uh, importance of considering the particular circumstances of a country and what the drivers uh, are for action. But I'm sure we'll get another perspective on it now from uh, Peter uh, Volcott. Thank you, Peter. Uh, thank you very much. Um, great pleasure to be here to speak on climate change, which is a subject that I have a great deal of personal commitment to and to the Paris Agreement. I, I've been in the Australian High Commission here for five weeks, but prior to that I was our ambassador for the environment, and in part of that job I was our lead negotiator on the climate change negotiations leading up to Paris. And it was a great privilege, privilege to actually work with Joe Tyndall and Tim Grosser, who were an extraordinary team in terms of, uh, of their knowledge and their commitment to the issues. So it's good to, see, good to see Joe again here. I know Tim is now in, now in Washington. Um, but for us, it was, I mean, Paris really was um, an outstanding, I think, an outstanding agreement. And you can't underestimate just what a significant shift it is. And you can't underestimate just how significant the challenges are going forward into the future as well. I mean, essentially what we did in Paris was throw away the old rule book, which wasn't working. Uh, the whole Kyoto way of doing business uh, basically covered off about 13% of global emissions. And uh, you had a situation where by 2030, two thirds of global emissions will come from non-annex one countries, i.e. the non-developed world. And under the Kyoto principles, uh, developed countries who signed up to Kyoto took on commitments so under the UNFCCC. Uh, Non-annex one countries uh, did not take on any commitments. And if we're going to fix this, if we're going to do this right, we really had to, to, to shift to, a, to a, a situation where all countries took on an important role according to their c capabilities according to their and to also according to their emissions profiles, made a common effort to tackle climate change. And that's actually what Paris delivered. And uh, that, um, to get diplomats to change a playbook, to start almost to start again in approaching something, uh, it's not easy. We tend to rely on past practice. We tend to rely on the way we do, we've always done business in, in, in the past. And so Paris really did, did uh, produce a, a very major shift in, in, global, in, in sort of global approach to climate change. And you've got to pay tribute to the French as well, because not only did they produce a masterly diplomatic performance in terms of timing and when they took over the process and how they helped deliver a very strong outcome, um, but also they did something else which I think is fundamentally important to all of you here, and that is they, um, not, tr traditionally NGOs have played a, a very important part along with government representatives at, at, UNF, at these negotiations. Uh, but business has been a bit sidelined, and uh, what the French did is they brought business and they brought cities and they brought uh, the sort of almost the real world a actors into the process of climate change. How, if we're gonna address climate change, innovation is gonna play a huge role 
in that. And the front, what, and uh, cities are going to play, play a huge role in that. Business is going to play a huge role in that. And NGOs who have always driven this will continue to play a huge role, of course. But you really need that coalition of interests driving this. And the French recognise this through the Lima Paris Action Agenda, and they brought business very much into the centre of things, and they brought cities very much into the centre of things. And I think that'll be a, a lasting legacy, apart from the Paris Agreement itself. I think that'll be a lasting legacy of what, what, uh, what, what the French achieved. And I can talk a little bit later about, more in questions, about why um, Paris was a su success and Copenhagen uh, wasn't, because there's some interesting sort of parallels in, 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 in that as well. So you have, a, you, have a, um, you have an agreement which is going to rely, as I say, it's a different agreement. Before, it was, Kyoto was a top-down process. Targets were negotiated, they were set, and it was an attempt to do a top-down process. What we did in the lead-up to Paris is understand that that wasn't going to solve the problem. What we needed to do was actually have a completely different way of doing business, and that is essentially self uh, self in a way self-determination, self-differentiation, Countries themselves will determine what their target is, and that target will be reviewed um, and uh, every five or ten years, depending on the sort of the schedule. And you'll, you rely on public pressure, you'll rely on peer pressure, and you'll rely on the pressure of the science to make sure that we give ourselves a realistic chance of keeping within the two-degree two guardrail. Now, I know the Pacific, the Pacific played actually the PICs, the, or the small island developing states, played a very, very powerful role in, uh, in Paris as well. And I want to congratulate Tonga and, and the others who really sort of led the charge on this about getting a real focus on issues like loss and damage, getting a real focus on, on the 1.5 degrees. Uh, now, there are lots of different targets within the um, uh, aspirational targets within the uh, Paris Agreement. Two degrees is, I guess, the core guardrail. But of course, there's, there's a great deal of reference to 1.5 and, and a real understanding and acceptance that for Pacific Island states, it really matters. That, that 0.5 degree difference is a, huge, is, a, is a huge difference in terms of their ability to survive and manage um, it, it sort of uh, extreme weather events, uh, uh, rise, rising, um, uh, rising sea levels, all those sorts of issues that they're, they're, they're confronting. Now, Paris also, um, um, there was a price for the Paris Agreement. There's always going to be a price if you get, we want to get the developing world to sign up to something like the Paris Agreement where they take on, uh, take on obligations themselves. There's going to be a price for that, and that's essentially finance. And uh, I thought in the end the price was a very, was a very reasonable outcome. It was well negotiated. Um, you had an agreement out of Copenhagen for $100 billion of, of finance. Um, to be reached or to be provided by the developed world by, by, by 2020. Uh, it's $100 billion annually by 2020. Uh, essentially what uh, Paris did was committed to that going forward, that continuing, but a review in 2025. And one of the interesting aspects of this, which is also picked up in the questions you put to us, is how is that, how is that going to be divided between essentially um, adaptation work and also um, essentially emissions reduction work. And this is the question of resilience, because if you look at the figures on that, uh, what they do show is that most of the money being invested is actually going into, uh, not into adaptation, not into sort of climate resilience activities, but in relation to uh, power different forms of power generation, its emissions reductions aspects, which is, the, which is where the money tends to flow. So how do you get it to flow into the adaptation area? And that's one of the things we're looking at. Obviously, the Green Climate Fund is important in that, and uh, the minister mentioned that. Australia co-chairs the Green Climate Fund with South Africa at the moment, and one of the things that has been done is they've put in a 50-50 split between, uh, between the two aspects. And obviously, Australia is working very hard to ensure that uh, we try to simplify the processes to get money out the door, and that, again, it's not just a... Um, a body that talks is a body that actually delivers in terms of, in terms of, climate, of climate finance. Uh, Australia itself is actually, uh, we, as part of our preparations for Paris, we put in a, um, a, a, essentially a 200 million floor in our aid, aid budget for climate finance as well. And that again is uh, to be looked at in terms of uh, largely in relation to adaptation work. But it's, it's critically important that uh, um, innovation 
business. I think I'm being asked to sit down, am I? That's, uh, I, 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 better, I, better, I better wind up, because like Joe, I could go on for a long time. This is a subject dear to my heart, and I'm very happy to take questions uh, later. But uh, as I say, uh, one of the business and innovation are going to be critical to keeping within that, uh, that, that, that guardrail we've set for ourselves. As Joe said, we've got to two points. Uh, the estimates are 2.7 per cent, maybe. Um, there's, a lot, there's a long way to go. And Australia is actually, we are an energy superpower, becoming an energy superpower in terms of LNG, in terms of uranium, in terms of coal, but at the same, and we're tech, and also solar, and, um, but we're very conscious that, um, uh, again, we are ideologically neutral about what type, what form of energy it takes, but we have to be on a, have to be on a pathway for, uh, for low carbon, and a more climate resilient and more climate resilient development. And that underpins our whole approach to climate change at the moment. But thank you, I better sit down. I'm happy to take questions. It's not that we don't want to hear even more from you, it's that we are going to have the conversation and I know that there's a, a huge uh, uh, wish uh, for the audience to, to question. But uh, I think, Peter, if I may say so, extremely encouraging uh, and delighted that your uh, country is the co-chair for the Green Climate Fund, both because of what you said in terms of the emphasis on action, but actually for today's proceedings, this uh, recognition that we have to look at adaptation and resilience as well. Uh, as mitigation. So uh, I'm sure we're all looking forward to discussing that uh, further with, with the panel. So Anna, uh, would you like to come and give us a, a business perspective on some of these questions, please? Thanks very much, Joan. Um, hello, everyone. I'm, I'm very humbled uh, to be here and be able to compliment that panel. Um, I'm speaking from a business perspective for the Climate Markets and Investment Association. We are a London-based industry association, although we have members from South Africa and Brazil as well, but so far mainly developed countries. Um, our, our members mainly are businesses, industries, that are building the infrastructure for climate investments, for carbon markets to work. So uh, we are in a lucky position that we don't have any utilities as members. So we don't have emission reduction obligations um, or, or, or such positions to consider among those. So we can take more ambitious positions when it comes to, for example, the UNFCCC, UNFCCC process. We are accredited observers to the GCF and following this quite closely, we also are accredited observers to the UNFCCC and sort of other folks running around in the corridors chasing people like Joe <laughs> and um, sort of trying to lubricate the system and help you know, information flow to move between countries. I myself, I'm German, so I've you know, always had a head and ear to the German delegation there and um, understanding why they're so opposed to having a market mechanism and then you know, running over to the Africans and figuring out why they're so keen on having one and trying to make that com communication easier as part of our job. Um, what we also do is uh, we speak, since our, lots of our members are finance, um, finance, financial institutions, we've got accountants, uh, technical consultancies, as well as verifiers. So we're sort of listening now currently to those um, well, governments and their plans and, and understanding sort of how can we increase the, um, the investment flow into mitigation and adaptation projects and how we could make that work. And I think, um, well, there's, there's lots of challenges that we're facing at the moment. One challenge that we don't have is there that we do have money, that money is available, and I think the GCF has that, um, is, is aware of that. Climate finance has been pledged. Um, and is going to, you know, th the scale is go on only going to increase. But the question is how to deliver that on the ground, at scale. And for an organisation that comes out of the carbon market industry and has got lots of people running around in countries trying to identify projects, we figure that it's actually quite difficult to find those projects that meet standard banking criteria. So, and and that doesn't matter if we're talking about a public bank or a private bank. The 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 landing criteria for both are actually quite similar. Everybody's going for the biggest bang for the buck. So you know you, you're looking for the large wind farm that's that that could still be, be developed somewhere. 
finding project finance for that is relatively easy, but if we look at the mitigation potential and where it sits in the energy efficiency sector and the transport sector, um, but even for small-scale renewable energy um, distributed generation, it's actually quite hard to finance. Um, and that depends between countries, but generally speaking, it's, uh, I, I, don't, I don't think we're there yet um, to say that uh, you know, this, is, this is going effectively. I think we need more, um, certainly more reform also in the finance industry themselves. Uh, we need larger risk-taking facilities um, that can address or that, that can start pooling smaller investment projects. We need um, also, of course, improved domestic environments, financing environments, and that is, um, so the fossil fuel subsidy reform, an initiative that New Zealand is spearheading really at, at our heart. Um, we still see a lot of investment barriers lying in, you know, sort of subsidies and other support measures that are going into conventional energy if we speak about renewable energy deployment. Um, that is something that we really encourage to look at. The OECD has done a great um, study that came out last year, 2015, um, a fossil fuel subsidy inventory, I think it was called. Um, they found about 800 measures, I think, globally where, com where, where governments are still incentivizing the use of fossil fuels. And that can be, you know, go, go down even to corporate level um, incentives or just, uh, how's it called, if you get a sort of a, a private car uh, from, you know, from your employer, basically. And fringe benefits, these kind of things, right? So they, they could cut at everybody's personal, I guess, um, uh, comfort level, but but this is really the, the level that we need to look at if, we, if we're thinking of um, reducing emissions at scale. Um, well, I'll, I'll leave more to the, to, to the conversation that is going to come, but just for a regional perspective, now we're here in, so in Asia Pacific. Um, I was based out of Bangkok for some time and uh, had the pleasure to work with a number of countries, Thailand and M Malaysia and um, Indonesia particularly. And what I take away from that time is that uh, the, the largest emission growth, I think, lies in Southeast Asia, doesn't it? If we look at the power development plans and the planned coal capacity additions that will come online, if, if we look at power development plans, not the INDCs, those plans that country put forward, um, then really the biggest emission growth globally lies in this region. So Southeast Asia has got the potential to roast this planet or not. And this is, this is how some people phrase it, and I think this is also how it um, probably a bit more diplomatically was phrased in the International Missions Trading. Um, um, oh sorry, the IEA's report on that that was um, featuring data from 2012. Anyway, so how, um, to, how to avoid that is is a key challenge, I think. Um, how can we look at um, power development plans and sometimes even just utility plans? They don't, they don't even seem to match. Utility plans for their expansion together with power development plans. Every new coal-fired station that will be built, I believe, or I guess we believe, should be looked at and you know, very critically assessed. Is that investment really needed or um, is that also something that could be replaced with other sorts of fuels? Um, and more diligent, uh, diligently actually going back into some of those plans could be helpful. Our time we need to act is now we got 15 to 20 years to basically halve our emissions. 50 gigatons per year is the, is the annual global emissions. We need to halve this within the next 15 to 20 years. Um, this, is, uh, this is my professional lifespan, for sure, a little longer. Um, you know, that's what I'll be doing the next 20 years, trying to work with a lot of you, I think 50% if I look through that room. Um, there's, there's a lot of young faces around, so um, that's a big chance for us, um, or a big chance and a big challenge as well. Um, every person who's in that role currently, I think, and, and within that professional lifetime, that, I guess, uh, needs to be the target for us to make this planet um, work for future generations. Thank you very much. Well, uh, really um, fascinating stuff and, and the perspective of, of what it feels like uh, to be in the energy business and trying to invest in solutions which might contribute but being uh, frustrated. So just um, picking up on that, um, 
is uh, we, we have um, the Green Climate Fund, we have other initiatives on financing, uh, we've got the emphasis on um, market-based solutions. Could I ask the panel, I mean, what would they like to see uh, that would actually unlock the financial investment to flow uh, more quickly and, and to flow to the, the right uh, places? I mean, including um, the building of capacity, which um, uh, CSO, uh, sorry, CSC, um, uh, actually uh, highlighted right at the outset. So uh, who would like to, to start on, on this issue about how we get that finance to flow to the right places and quickly enough? Jo, please. I'm sorry, no, I'm happy to, to start. Um, because it, it um, is, uh, I think, a subject dear to our hearts. Um, over the course of the, the negotiations, um, well, actually, the, the trigger for this was New Zealand co-hosting with the EU Commission a Pacific Energy Summit in Auckland in 2013, um, where um, a, a large number of Pacific leaders came um, with uh, energy plans, clean energy plans, uh, and uh, basically it was a, um, a matchmaking conference um, that uh, successfully uh, leveraged about half a billion US dollars worth of investment in clean energy projects around the Pacific. Um, and uh, that's been ongoing and in fact um, there's more momentum built. Um, I think Minister you referred to uh, Tonga's uh, energy strategy um, and uh, so New Zealand, um, along with other donors, uh, um, private investors, uh, multilateral um, and, and regional funds is supporting that. Um, and uh, what that triggered for us was um, an idea that we tried to pursue with, unfortunately in the end, fairly limited success in the climate change negotiations themselves, where we felt that it would be important to um, coalesce around some principles for effective climate finance. And we simplified this down to five um, core principles, um, which uh, began by putting uh, developing countries in the driver's seat to, to determine their own uh, priorities, uh, whether that was uh, in terms of reducing emissions or building resilience, um, encouraged development partners to uh, align themselves behind uh, those priorities, and had a number of other uh, principles around, um, I guess, smoothing the way through improved transparency, better coordinated systems, um, and, uh, um, and also a principle about ensuring that private sector investment was crowded in. Now, of course, principles aren't the answer in and of themselves, but we felt that if um, governments um, could start to align behind those principles. It would help to overcome some of the barriers um, uh, that we've got that Anna um, was alluding to uh, in getting, well certainly in, in the case of private investors, getting that shift from brown investment to green investment. So that was just a, um, uh, we haven't given up on these ideas. Um, we would still like to, to find some ways to, to um, push them through. Um, Thank you, Joe. See how see them. I'll just quickly comment on it. I, I mean, uh, when people talk about, you know, Papua New Guinea as a small island developing states, <laughs> kind of make me worried, you know. <laughs> Papua New Guinea is the largest Pacific Island countries. And, and when, you're, when we're talking about small, it's all about Tuvalu, less than 20,000. So how can you make the scale, uh, you know, it doesn't make sense when, when you're talking about scale, uh, especially at that kind of level. Um, uh, of population and, and size. So we, we need to come up with some innovative financial package. You know, something similar to, you know, we, we have the Pacific Catastrophe Insurance uh, uh, Pilot Scheme. And Chairman, uh, during the Paris uh, COP21, pledged some more financial assistance with that scheme. We need to come up with something similar. Uh, because, I mean, uh, simply, you know, relying on sizes or economy of scale doesn't work in the Pacific. Uh, one of the other ideas that have been floating around that we have discussed with development partners such as World Bank and ATP and even New Zealand was actually having some kind of guarantee facility in place. 
You know, for, for even if it's not for, the, for a particular Pacific Island country, maybe we can look at it as a regional guarantee facilities that actually reduce the risk for potential investors, especially on renewable energy sectors, to, to actually come in uh, to countries such as Tonga, Tuvalu, and so forth. So we, we need to actually have a paradigm shift, start thinking differently, especially when it comes down to the Pacific. I mean, Asia, I think that's fine. But we in the Pacific are the more vulnerable ones, and our size doesn't make things easier when you're actually talking about financing. The, the, the other comments I had is that we, we were talking about the fact that with GCF, this was pre-COP21, uh, it, it's the country that actually know how to write proposal that are actually getting the funding rather mm -hmm. than those mm -hmm. that actually need it most. So I, I think hopefully after COP21 uh, that, that procedures uh, actually are making, uh, there, there are some changes in the procedures to actually make it more accessible to especially small countries like those in the Pacific that have severe lack of capacity to actually you know, now we actually have to write a proposal to get assistance to write another proposal. You know, so uh, ho hopefully, uh, 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 changing the way you, you, how we do things uh, in actually accessing fund, especially for small island developing states, uh, is something that that can be further discussed. Thank you. And, and really ties back to your introductory remarks around uh, building capacity. And I, I'm conscious from other work I did, uh, you know, what a mistake we made on the uh, clean development mechanism, really, which benefited a certain number of countries who became very adept at applying for money. And they applied it, a lot of them, very well. Uh, but then there were other whole areas which just didn't uh, benefit from what could have been quite powerful assistance. But Peter, you, you are co-chairing, your country's co-chairing the GCF. What would you like to share on this financing? Uh, sure. Look, look, thank you. Um, obviously, um, innovative finance, it leverages private sector investment. It's going to be crucial to mobilise the $100 billion per year of global climate finance we're looking to reach, uh, looking, to, looking to get to by 2020 and, be, and beyond 2025 before the review. And uh, we're actually, uh, what's interesting is the OEC did a report um, about September last year, which was, which showed that we're, we're, all, we're actually on track in terms of $60 billion that was basically flowing. There were issues about the split between mitigation finance and adaptation finance, which, uh, which uh, you, you've referred to. And there are genuine issues also in relation to where that's going. Obviously, it's a lot of that money will be flowing to the bigger economies, you know, the, the, the Chinas or the Indias. And so for c the smaller economies like, in, in like, in, like Tonga in the Pacific, that's, that's a real issue as to how do, they, how, how do they get access to private sector finance, but also in terms of the capacity to access the money that's available through the Green Climate Fund. And that, that is something both Australia and New Zealand through our development assistance programs are very conscious of, that it's about building up the capacity, uh, ma making, the, making the processes uh, less complicated for smaller sums and making sure that the capacity is there in those small island developing states for them to be able to access uh, access the uh, the money that that is there so that, that is a big issue and very conscious uh, very conscious of that as are as we are of the the need to split the money between mitigation and adaptation uh, and I might just also mention something that hasn't been ha hasn't been discussed but uh, again it comes back to sort of my basic thing about the importance of uh, of innovation. Uh, Bill Gates did a very interesting interview before Paris in which he talked about the money that Big Pharma had, was investing in uh, essentially in, uh, in the pharmaceutical industry and in research and development, just how enormous those sums were and how there was nothing like that going into innovation and work in the, in the, climate, uh, in the climate and energy space. And so he, said he basically with, um, pushed this idea of an innovation, uh, uh, an innovation fund, which he had... Um, the Americans and the Chinese and the Indians and the Australians and Germans and others sign up to, and that's a commitment to double uh, double R and D work in 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 the um, in the energy uh, in the energy space for governments to double R and D investment uh, by 2020, which is a significant commitment by many of these governments. Um, but also, he put a lot of his own money. He put, he put a billion dollars of his own money into that, and he also lined up a lot of his rich mates to do, do, do a similar thing. So again, it shows how, um, in fact, the, how innovation is going to be central to this as well, 
and business in terms of innovative finance. Thank you very much. Now, um, Anna, you've heard the other panelists talk about it from the public perspective, and you said in your remarks um, how difficult it was. And, and I was particularly interested because there's Joe quoting the IEA report saying 50% of the gap between the 2.7 degree and the 2 degree could be bridged by energy efficiency projects. And I think I heard you say they're particularly difficult to get financing from. So as a, a, a business person, an investor and so on, what would you like to see that would actually uh, help to come overcome that uh, uh, bump in the road, if you will? Well, since we're speaking about energy, reform of electricity markets, I think, is one of of the first things that spring to mind, really. Um, if we're looking at project development and developing projects that are bankable, financeable, um, there has to be some sort of revenue generating activity around that. And um, the w one of the common comments that we get if we speak about increasing deployment rates for renewable energy is, you know, the comment, this is gonna be too expensive. We can't really do this. It's, it's gonna, you know, the power bill will just go through the roof. And um, yeah, we basically just can't afford it. Working with that, work, working with those, with this criticism and those comments, I think is one of the key things we need to do. Coming from a country, uh, Germany, where we've started the energy transition discussion 35 years ago in 1980 more or less, um, we're still now confronted with that conversation. But um, I, actually, I'd like to ask, can, can I just make a quick poll through the audience? Who actually knows their electricity bill? D do you know how much you pay at how, at your, in your house uh, for power? How many people hands up? Well, that's a lot. But that you're professionals, right? <laughs> you do this elsewhere, and then <laughs> normally it's like five or 10 people, right? Um, but so lots of people actually don't know how much they pay for power. Um, in it, how many people of you think of who heard of the German feed-in tariff? You probably all know that we introduced a feed-in tariff, and that was our main instrument that helped us to install about 80 gigawatt of renewable energy. Now this is about 50 percent of our generation capacity in Germany. How many? Who of you thinks that this is a subsidy? Is the feed-in tariff a subsidy? All right, so that's about a third, I would guess. I guess it depends on the def definition of a subsidy. Well, it does, really. um, it does. But um, yeah. what is what is important to take away? Those costs, the the feed-in tariff, are entirely uh, or passed on to household level to consumers. They're they're entirely paid by the consumers themselves. Um, and that is actually, so it's, it's, it's a cost that the consumer sees in their power bill. However, all, this, all the support that fossil fuel generating companies are getting um, and have been getting in the past, they are um, provided by, by the budget, by di directly by, uh, by the taxes, but they're not seeable by the consumer. However, they've been much higher. Um, so the conversation is more about fuel price transparency and uh, or electricity bill transparency. And I think this is one of the key barriers that we still facing with we're still having those conversations about can we actually afford it but can we afford the status quo is a question that we need to ask ourselves and Thank in Germany you. I don't actually know how electricity prices are okay. being formed and I'd be keen to hear um, from you know from the audience if, if you are aware of how your electricity price is being set I think those are conversations okay. that need to be had thank you Sorry for o for okay being well I'm sure we will have those conversations um, but um, we've uh, had a, a great session with the panel and I'm sure we're all bursting with questions uh, about what this means for uh, either your own country or policy or the themes of resilience which we've already uh, started to unpack in the conference. So I'd like to take uh, two questions and then we'll ask the panel to answer and then if they're brief enough we'll take another two. So um, where do I see questions? Well, maybe people aren't. Oh, yes. Thank you. This gentleman here. And one more. Management Association of New Zealand. Um, I'm just wondering about energy efficiency finance. Uh, and you talked about a lot of energy efficiency projects not meeting um, standard banking fun financing criteria. What Can the panel sort of describe to me a little bit more what are the issues going on here? Why, 
why aren't these projects meeting ba standard banking criteria? Thank you. And one more? Okay. Okay, well, we'll ask Anna to just uh, respond to that particular thing about the issues around financing energy efficiency projects. Right. I, well, it's not that, not that easy to answer, actually, because it doesn't make sense logically, I think. Most of the energy efficiency investments get payback periods of three to five years, so everybody would think, you know, you've got to do them automatically. However, what we do find with... Um, yeah, with companies that are that even with larger balance sheets, they they don't want to spend these this investments into cost saving activities. They want to spend them on productive activities. That's how they see it. It's it, it's very hard um, to convince uh, boards about um, investments that will help them save costs further down the road if they don't increase the output level um, of of. Um, of that business and why that is the case I don't actually we don't actually know ourselves just one quick comment um, crowd crowdsourcing in finance is a new initiative where we see now first examples coming up in Europe um, especially in the residential sector where um, you know finance is being sought by it within a neighborhood to update uh, buildings and rooftops and so on so there's um, depends on what type of energy efficiency we're talking about I think um, previous example, industrial scale, and then the other one, residential scale. That's ov obviously very different f financing challenges. Okay, thank you. See, I'll just see just quick you comment. I mean, like for, for small island developing states, it's mainly through grants. Uh, I mean, like one good example is uh, the New Zealand Tonga bilateral assistance. A big component of it is about upgrading the, the, the grid, uh, not only to reduce losses. We're down to about 10% now. But also, it's all about safety. So I guess it's a bit different from Asia than in, in the Pacific, whereby it's normally it's, it's about the grant through bilateral assistance. Thank you. Um, I'll, I've got a question for the panel. If I've got several, but how actually can we ensure that our efforts to address these issues, I mean, particularly climate change, but also the impacts uh, of climate change on uh, the resilience of our energy systems, how can we make sure they outpace the rate at which the climate is changing? So, um, Peter, you've talked about uh, innovative approaches to financing. Um, is that innovation going to happen quickly enough, do you think? I mean, that, that's a very good question, particularly as the, the most vulnerable states uh, to climate change are often those with the smaller scale economies. It's harder to attract, uh, uh, harder to attract private sector investment into them. So that's where governments need to be and, and the public sector needs to be a catalyst for that. And it's why we're talking a lot about capacity building and access, as access to funding. But uh, I think it, we need to also keep in mind that resilience is not just about uh, providing climate finance and making sure that the, the building standards are right and that roads and hospitals are built and schools are built with uh, an eye to what, can, what could happen. But it's also about systemic changes in, in the economy. So it's about improved governance standards as well. And it's also public decision making and through community development. So there's actually a whole suite of things which go with, with climate resilience. And it's not just about money. Obviously the money is fundamental, but there are a whole range of public policy issues which need need to be uh, need to be considered as well in, in ensuring climate resilience. Yeah, Joe, do you want to add anything there? Uh, just a um, a couple of little things. I I, I think um, one is if we think about what spurs innovation, it is quite often you know severe events, like war, for example. I'm not suggesting war is the answer, um, but uh, um, but but. If climate change starts to have those incredibly severe um, impacts, then it does spur um, a business, um, a technology and innovation response. And you start to look at things like, um, in our own uh, country, the Christchurch earthquakes um, and insurance, um, the insurance sector. And I think, uh, I think that those sorts of things um, can uh, actually drive um, quite significant uh, change. I, I would also just make the point that I'm not sure that it's a linear 
direction and correlation. Um, that uh, you, you, d you could and should, I would hope, see a, a kind of a, a bend of the curve, an exponential uh, um, change, uh, uh, even if technology might be a little bit delayed behind the pace of climate change itself. Once that technology and or the regulatory changes and, and settings within governments start to take hold, then the pace of change can ac accelerate, we would hope, to catch up with what might be happening with, with climate change. Um, and, and I guess the third point is, is really to pick up on the Minister's um, uh, point uh, that she was making about having a plan and the need to have a plan. And that, I think, is one really important thing that has come out of the Paris Agreement. Um, uh, and, and that is a very clear expectation, invitation, call it what you want. Um, so first of all, you've got a clear direction the world will be moving to a low carbon future um, with the, uh, the long-term goal for the second half of the century. And there's an invitation to individual governments to think about their long-term low emissions pathways. Um, and if, if governments do start to think about that now, and they will be thinking about it now, ahead of 2020, then that really can focus the mind and, and uh, um, I think help to change the, the, the regulatory settings, the environment within which business um, is operating and making its investment decisions. For a small island country, I mean like, uh, I, I go back to the first speaker this morning where he talked about heart and soft uh, resilience. Uh, on, on the soft resilience, I think, it, uh, you know, disaster management practice, business continuity plan need to be enforced, need to be updated. Uh, if we tend to focus more on the hard resilience rather than the soft, but then the soft actually probably can have a better impact on, 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 your, uh, on your continuity. Uh, in terms of, of hard resilience, I mean like, uh, you know, pre-positioning supplies will be go a long way, but then, you know, a cyclone like Cyclone Winston can wipe out your pre-positioning stock. So, I mean, in the Pacific Island countries, maybe we start, should start thinking about a regional pre-positioning, whereby, for example, Tonga can get to Fiji much faster than New Zealand or Australia. Maybe we should have the stock in, uh, in Tonga. Maybe we should have stock in Fiji so that if Samoa and Tonga get hit, they can be resupplied from, from Fiji. I mean, we, we, we went down to Fiji to provide some supplies before uh, any of the other countries actually get there because we are closer. So we, we need to probably start thinking regionally, not just nationally about pre-positioning supplies, but also as a region, uh, especially when we're talking about small island developing states. Oh, and, and one last other thing. I think someone mentioned about building back better. You know, you're relying on wiping out your whole infrastructure and building it back, uh, you know, better. But I think I, I like to go with uh, building better now. Uh, there's a lot of investment now, so it's, it, this is the right time to actually do something about getting your resilience uh, in place. Thank you. Um, I think uh, that point about regional uh, coordination and a regional approach is really important. And one of the uh, Trilemma reports we did, um, it was cited in, uh, this was in Europe, but that the lack of regional coordination was a real deterrent to investment in infrastructure. Because often infrastructure does respect a national boundary, uh, depends on the topography, but often it doesn't. And even if it does, there might be complementarity, you know, between it. So, uh, and, and they actually said, we don't see any. We don't see any coordination of, of policy. So uh, I think that's a very strong lesson coming out of what you've, you've just said uh, in terms of confidence by I investors and um, ability to make these plans. But just a final uh, point, are there any specific points on uh, public-private sector partnerships, uh, particularly around this point of leveraging the finance. Is there anything any of you would particularly like to see there, whether it be uh, new processes or um, more engagement in the existing processes? I mean, is that, uh, it's, it's obviously a really key issue in the run-up to uh, the, the implementation of the INDCs and the review thereafter and how ambitious we can be. But uh, Peter, you actually mentioned um, the leveraging, I think, in your introductory remarks. 
Yeah, no, look, no, thank you. Um, there's, w there's one organisation, the Climate Te Technology Initiative, which um, has utilised donor funding to identify renewable energy uh, investments in developing countries and then gets them into investment, gets them investment ready and then presents them to global networks of some private investors. And that's actually, that actual that approach has shown some real benefits. I think it's raised over US $800 million uh, of private financing. And uh, that's an example of building on initiatives like that as one way of, of sort of catalyst, as I say, being a catalyst for sort of major private sector investment. So that's the sort of example of, of, where we, uh, of what we would like to see. Great. See, I'll see. And then with that, uh, Anna. Probably having a more uh, national accredited entities would help a long way. Um, in the Pacific, the only one regional organization is, has been accredited by GCF, which is the Regional Environment Program uh, based in the PSR more. Uh, I'm not sure whether there any of the uh, of the, the countries actually have a national accredited entities, and and this will actually, if there are some of them, that that will be very helpful in actually directing uh, have direct access to funding. Uh, and I think that's something that uh, some some of the uh, the readiness facilities probably can help in actually getting some of the like Ministry of Finance accredited and so forth. Uh, but the, the other two that I mentioned earlier on. I think will go a long way to the, the, the insurance insurance scheme and also the guarantee facility. And, and I'm, I'm personally working on pushing this, uh, this guarantee facility, especially with uh, development partners such as ATP and World Bank, and, and also, I mean, having discussions with other countries, because I think that will give comfort uh, to potential investors, especially in the renewable energy sector. Thank you. Anna? Just very briefly, one initiative I'd like to highlight to you guys, um, Climate Investor One is a new finance facility that is sort of the first baby that comes out of the Climate Policy Institute's Climate Finance Lab, uh, if I got that right, CPI's Climate Finance Innovation Lab yeah. or Innovation for Climate Finance. Climate Investor One, look it up. It's a very interesting structure because it's, I think, the first structure um, that at large scale finances, project identification development, construction, and then um, bundles those projects once they're operational, structures them in yield costs, and brings in the institutional investors. So th that really is the question, how to bring in institutional investors. They need uh, the vanilla type investments, so large, really large investment sizes. Um, structuring those and the yield costs can be an option. That's one of the first facilities that is trying to do that. Thank you. We'll, we'll see, you know, if they'll be successful. So if, if that really is innovation. Thank you. Jo? Um, you have four quick things, uh, I think, and, and uh, one is to, um, to look at ways of uh, encouraging uh, and helping um, uh, those seeking climate finance to have investment-ready projects, um, uh, you know, because... Yeah. Financiers still have to have uh, fulfilled fiduciary responsibilities, um, and uh, um, not sort of you know write blank checks or put uh, money away you know without uh, um, it being well thought through. Um, and I think there's uh, a great deal of work to be done to help that to happen, because as everybody said, the quantum of finance is not the issue. The money is there. Money is there internationally. It's how it, it, it can be directed. Secondly, and, and I think it, it does pick up, when it comes to private finance, it does pick up on the point, your theme that you have been um, running in this morning's um, uh, discussion, and that is around scale. Um, because it's certainly, um, you know, in our discussions with private investors here in New Zealand, um, they can see two economies um, in the Pacific, Papua New Guinea, you mentioned, and Fiji, uh, that are of sufficient scale uh, to make it um, attractive, easy, workable uh, for private finance to, uh, to be part of the picture. So I, I think we need to, to work on that. And again, a kind of more aggregated, aggregated or regional type approach may help there. Third thing I wanted to mention was the private sector facility of the Green Climate Fund. I'm not sure that's sort of operating at, at maximum efficiency or effectiveness at the moment. It was a really important innovation of the GCF. It will be great to see that working really, really well. Um, and um, fourthly, I guess I'm not sure if it's the same 
um, initiative you were talking about, Anna, but certainly out of the UK, um, a really interesting initiative to um, foster and support uh, into the market new financing structures um, that are specifically around climate finance. Um, one area that, that uh, um, could be looked into there is, is leveraging off fossil fuel <coughs> subsidy reform uh, to, to look at innovative financing structures that would help and support governments to do that. Thanks. <laughs>